Namaskar, Nileshok, and welcome to the series Shraddha and Pradnya, part 50. In this particular series, I use this as a platform, this particular theme, Shraddha and Pradnya, uh, to explore various issues as they relate to Indian civilization, all aspects of Indian civilization. And today we will look at a specific uh, issue uh, related to the antiquity of Indian civilization, part 50. All right, let's begin. This is a bit of a flexible format and I sometimes share a new research finding, some new discovery. Other times, uh, some specific point I would like to cover and um, anything else that people may find it interesting. Also the questions like what I'm going to do today, people asking questions. Uh, so let's jump into that. <laughs> Uh, I have covered a few questions from Girish J. Naik. Uh, and recently, this one he wrote on Twitter. Uh, he's referring to a foreword uh, written by someone for somebody's book like RRMR. And in that context, uh, Girish J. Naik is writing, he invites my response to the following, which actually I gave a response on the Twitter itself. Uh, so the part of the foreword written by whoever to this book uh, has made four claims that uh, myself, Nilesh, has no first-hand knowledge of Sanskrit. Now, I'm not sure how you define first-hand knowledge. I've said many times that I never officially learned Sanskrit in school, uh, never officially learned grammar per se, Sanskrit grammar. Uh, now, what I have found over many years that... Um, my self-taught knowledge of Sanskrit is many times a uh, lot more than the people who have studied in Sanskrit. Like someone very, my very close relative, just not to bring very personal uh, individual, like he, she would not mind at all, but it's not even relevant. Uh, she has a bachelor's, okay, a degree in Sanskrit. Uh, the extent or the quality changes from place to place, university to university. Uh, but actually, uh, I realize, and she knows it, that she hardly knows Sanskrit. But this is not about uh, me boasting about my Sanskrit. I, I will say uh, that I take help from all kinds of, all different people, okay? University professors, academics, uh, yes, people who, are uh, Sanskrit experts, people who can speak fluently, write fluently, read fluently, uh, not just ordinary Sanskrit, what I mean by ordinary, just a superficial level, but people who can uh, help me go 20 levels deeper in terms of uh, the etymo from the etymology perspective, uh, it's uh, utpatti, you know, vyutpatti, but utpatti from the nirukta perspective and so on. So I rely on that help. So, but when somebody says, oh, this guy admitted he has no first-hand knowledge of social growth, I mean, that's absolutely idiotic, careless, and casual. And so my response is, no, that's a, a wrong information. Uh, he relies on metaphors. Absolutely wrong. I rely on evidence that is testable uh, using different disciplines of sciences different disciplines of sciences such as astronomy, archaeology, geology, oceanography, climatology, physical anthropology, genetics, seismology, on and on. Now, if you are extracting information from the Indian, ancient Indian texts such as say Mahabharata, Ramayana and many others, not all but many of them are composed in a poetic fashion using a certain meter and so on so that these things are easy to remember uh, and they ex they explain things using metaphors bhagavad gita is full of metaphors i mean sometime in one verse uh, you will have three metaphors to just mention one point 
ओके फॉर एक्झाम्पल धुळीने झाकी लागणी यु नो धुमराने झाकी लागणी सॉरी धुमराने झाकी लागणी धुळीने आरसा जसा वाऱ्या धुळीने आरसा जसा वारेने वेष्टीला गर्भ कामाने ज्ञान हे तसे जस्ट टू डेमॉन्स्ट्रेट और एक्सप्लेन हाऊ इवन ए नॉलेजेबल पर्सन इफ द पर्सन हॅज अ डिझायर ओके द पर्सन इज uh the desire is so strong that it can even hide the genuine knowledge and the person will not able to use that knowledge to reach the right conclusion this is a good example of that by the way here so just now what i just said this is a marathi translation of sanskrit words from bhagavad gita just to show this that how a kama desire okay Uh, when the purity is personal purity is not there it can hide the no, even knowledge even if it exist just to say that it gave three metaphors and if you look at those three metaphors they are all practical examples that's the definition of a metaphor but in any case just to answer that question it is utterly stupid statement foolish statement wrong statement idiotic statement okay the improper statement that i rely on metaphors no i don't i rely on evidence once i define a theory that theory statement which has to be generic universal defines what is evidence and that evidence must be captured so wrong no peer review this is a bogey of a peer review of course now uh, just to stop such uh, idiotic rants you know i have published something recently it will come out very soon in a peer reviewed paper but it's a extremely inefficient process but more than that who are my peers there are hundreds of people who have similar claims like me for the dating of mahabharat or dating of mahabharat dating of sushruta on and on and not just dating you know say uh, kumbhakarna and klein levin syndrome now that's not about a dating okay so not the date and if somebody thinks no kumbhakarna did not have a klein levin syndrome hey then you it's a duty of that person to say then what condition kumbhakarna had what medical condition kumbhakarna had then we can have a debate if assuming the both parties are willing and both parties are decent okay both parties have to agree to certain basic rules so the i don't have a peers that's what i said people don't willing to come i had i have had uh, three uh, two debates on the mahabharata dating and one panel discussion okay these this panel discussion is out there on the youtube you can watch it and see what people talk the debates are out there one in three parts and one in one part and just watch it the, the, i have no peers but assuming we can make approximation for that uh, they should be willing to come and review my work okay i mean there are some folks who are reviewing the reviewing my work and uh, i'm thankful to them the humor and the jokes and the uh, the utter uh, uh, hilarious uh, entertainment that they are creating and i'm thankful to them it is it, it is uh, on people okay it's responsibility of people to read these works read my works do the comparison use their knowledge these works are creating good opportunities for people to test their own knowledge the knowledge of these people who are creating these works the knowledge of mine who has created original works and they these individuals who review these comparative works of their own knowledge okay so it's a great opportunity by the way but my point is i have no peers and no i have no intention of doing this unless somebody gives me a well paid academic position in which the requirement is that you publish peer reviewed papers then i would crank Uh, i would be one of the 95 percentile you know in the what you call 95 percentile top 5 percent of the folks in terms of number of papers and even the quality of papers i'll give you some example like um, uh doctor uh, not doctor uh, rajiv malhotra ji um, uh, uh, organized uh, initiated created few conferences in a uh, uh, what is that uh, indology um, swadesh indology series i happen to participate into two and in those were peer reviewed papers by the way and i presented one paper each in each of the conference those both papers received the best paper award in that category those are peer reviewed papers okay now peer reviewed process peer review process is usually double blind type of thing you don't know exactly who is reviewing your papers but 
you can generally guess, you know, I mean, uh, because somebody has to be a somewhat at least a reasonable expert from your side. Notwithstanding that, these were peer-reviewed papers. They were, they are published in the proceedings of the conferences. And in both cases, I won the best paper award in my category. Okay, enough for that peer, no peer review nonsense. The third one is a Gita Press translations ignored. What a foolishness. I, people have, all people have to do is watch my videos, uh, YouTube videos, where uh, not because of this nonsense, but as, because I have not read, I even don't know uh, what this forward is. Uh, I can guess the book, but uh, I have not read any of it. But I even wanted to show how these different translators, no matter any take any two translators, very likely they are going to uh, vary from each other. Why is that? Because we are trying to understand if it's a Rama and Mahabharat, we are trying to understand the mind of Bhagwan Vyasadeva or Bhagwan Valmiki. And there is a huge time gap between the uh, between when they composed these works and now we're reading it. Bhagwan Valmiki was a contemporary of Ramayana times. Bhagwan Vasa was contemporary of Mahabharata times. And I have shown Mahabharata happened more than 7,500 years, 500 years ago. I have shown Ramayana happened more than 14,000 years ago. So Gita Press translation, in fact, invariably, I, because Gita Press has done such a phenomenal job of making these texts available, I start with a Gita Press translation if it exists. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, let me see if it's here. Well, I don't have it here right now. Um, uh, Valmiki Ramayan, I have an English translation uh, from Gita Press. Uh, many, play, many cases, the English that is used and the way it is translated is extremely bad. But I cannot think of any translation which is correct, correct which is perfect. And that has to do with people's uh, lack of vaptidnya, lack of background knowledge. So many, many portions of the translation, a given translator will do just fine. However, when it comes to a subject matter expertise, when it's required, let's say the reference is related to hydrology or astronomy or archaeology or seismology or climatology uh, or uh, astronomy in a generic sense, like calendrical sense. If the person who is translating it does not have that background, then that person makes mistakes. Uh, I can show you if somebody pays me for it. Okay, for every mistake I show in a Gita Press translation, and not just Gita Press, any translation. Uh, uh, take um, Kishore Mohan Ganguly's translation, or Bibek Debroy's translation, or uh, uh, Pandit uh, Satavadekar, you know, uh, translation. Uh, yeah, I can show the I can show the errors in those. Uh, not every error. I mean, all of them uh, have done a good job, but uh, none of the translation can be considered error proof. Okay, mistake proof. So I do not ignore Gita Press translations. I mean, what a stupid argument is this or what kind of stupid uh, accusation is this? I start with Gita Press translation. Uh, Mahabharata, I have um, Gita Press translation in Hindi. That's when I start. But this is like, you know, something, a controversy that doesn't exist. They want to do it. This is called mental diarrhea, okay? And I'll show you a, a wonderful example of mental diarrhea. Uh, by in, in the same forward, you know, whatever that forward is. Uh, and that's why I'm not taking even the names, okay? Because uh, I'm going to show you today example of their intellectual diarrhea. This is what when I'm asking the accusations they are making and that I'm responding to. This is a good example of their mental diarrhea. And I don't, if I take names, they will start having physical diarrhea, okay? So this is mental diarrhea, by the way. So in responding to... And now Girish G. Naik is simply quoting from this forward. And so I wanted to respond in a succinct fashion. Okay. So first one, I have only first, I sorry, I have no first hand knowledge of Sanskrit. Wrong. As I let me make it clear, I never officially studied Sanskrit in the class, my or grammar of Sanskrit. I did study Marathi grammar, I did study English grammar, and so on and so forth, but that's not the point. Uh, as a language, but I grew up in a family where like before even I went to a school, uh, I had Sanskrit, uh, what do you call, stotra by heart, <laughs> okay? And I did not understand the meaning of the, that stotra or those stotra that I learned or the shloka I learned. But guess what? 
with help or the fact that I was reciting for a long time, I learned them. Uh, I'll give you an example a few years ago. And the, I'm giving this example for a very specific reason. Like my wife, who for many years said she does not understand when people speak Sanskrit. I said, this is a, uh, what, you, what you say, this is a conscious feeling that you are having that you will not understand and therefore you don't understand. I said, you know, just, just pay attention. You know, they are not saying anything complicated. And for a few, year, a few years now, I can't tell you exactly how many years, uh, maybe last 10 years or something, seven, eight years, uh, something like that. And uh, one time we were there and the speaker, actually series of speakers, they were speaking in Sanskrit. And we were sitting next to each other. She's saying, well, do you understand? I said, yeah, I understand 90%. I can translate everything to you. Maybe not word to word. This was say maybe seven years ago. I'll tell you seven years after, like today, or actually a few years ago. Now she's, she understands when somebody is speaking Sanskrit. Again, not word to word. My point is, it's not that complicated, guys. You learn languages by assimilation. I can say 20 sentences, maybe by rote, okay, in some 20 languages of the world, <laughs> okay, do reasonable things, even in Chinese, for example, you know, and there is instance when sometime I spoke some Chinese, of course, a standard uh, phrases by heart on the streets of China. And essentially, I was saying, I don't know no good. In, somebody was trying to speak with me in Chinese and say, I don't know good Chinese or I don't speak good Chinese. And some ordinary person from uh, the street, like say at a railway station or something, you know, uh, and he just looks at me and says, what are you kidding? You know, and not to impress me or something. He's just saying, you're speaking very fluent Chinese. Well, my Chinese was limited. It's nothing like that with the Sanskrit. Anyways, uh, peers, I already said, who are my peers? Of course, if I have a uh, academic position and I hereby uh, make appeal to uh, different universities uh, around the world, India, uh, if they give me position, I teach a lot of other things. And, you know, um, I don't have a PhD. I don't, uh, you know, so, but uh, honorary PhD will be good. <laughs> okay. But I can crank as many papers as people want, a very high quality papers that will win awards and I'll be in the 95th percentile. Why do I say that? Because uh, growing up studying, I was fortunate to work in the uh, research labs when even I was an undergrad student of very famous, world famous professors, okay? And I have seen how papers can be cranked, okay? Cranked, I'm using in a word, in a sense, the efficiency, not like just for the heck of it, not like the way they were cranked when I was a afterwards master student during in artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence is getting very sophisticated. Anyways, I'm digressing. So I'm willing to have an open on camera and put an edited debate on their claims versus mine. If there are these peers who have guts to come forward, I have already done it. In fact, uh, I, in, I ask people, can you show me on camera any debate? I would like to see those debates happening. So far, I am not aware of any. Say about the dating of Mahabharata or dating of Ramayana, where two or more people, preferably two, are debating their claims against each other. And that recording has no Nileshok in it. The three that I'm aware, two one-on-one -on -one, and one a panel discussion about the dating, I am involved in all three of them. So I don't know what uh, this nonsense is being uh, communicated and claimed here. Okay. Now this same uh, tweet, tweet, I think, by Girish Knight, he quoted a passage from this foreword, okay? And he wanted me to comment on it. Now, it's very difficult to comment in a Twitter. Now, if you uh, read this, I mean, you can, when you watch this, you can uh, pause the video and read all the bile, you know, the uh, mental diarrhea, you know, mental indigestion that is coming out. But even not getting into that, let's talk about some portion that we can, because mental is emotional, you know, okay. Tatrairasham raga dvesha moho arthantara bhavat. Okay, this is this this is good that this is happening. Okay, people are unsettled. It is very nice. So what is happening? Pravartana lakshana dosha. Through their actions, you can see what's going on in their head. Why they are agitated. Why they are disturbed. And that's a very good thing. Now, 
uh, emotions are very dif difficult to respond to. In fact, uh, even if I'm responding in a polite way, they start feeling they are abused. They have been, they have been, <laughs> they are being abused. That's what they feel. They don't realize that this is abuse. Okay, what can you do when somebody loses the mental balance? Then these kind of things happen. Um, but let's talk about something that can be intellectually discussed, not with them. I don't think they will ever understand it. If they understand it, that will be the turnaround for them in the right direction. Uh, but for the benefit of people and for the likes of such as uh, somebody who asks like uh, Girish G. Like. Uh, one portion here. Uh, so let's see. Let's see if we can find something sensible without that mental bile there. Uh, let's see. He relies completely on translations, mistranslations, which means the mistranslations exist. That's very important. And his own fanciful, uh, fanciful and inane interpretations, like taking similes and metaphors involving seasons and heavenly bodies as, act, fact, as factual statements of seasons and astronomical observations. Ah, glad he mentions that. Well, these are astronomical observations, if there is astronomy mentioned. But now let's go back. Uh, yeah, relies completely on translation. That's not true. I make my own translations, but I do begin with multiple translations. So relies completely, utter nonsense, foolishness, mistranslations. Well, thank God he said it. The mistranslations exist. It's very important to realize that. And his own fanciful and inane interpretations. I do use my interpretations. Now, guess what? What is fanciful and inane can be easily separated by Indriya Pramanya, objective testing, which no other Harikalal in this space of dating of Mahabharata or Ramayana dare do it. Dare do it behind, but dare do especially face to face. And for a disaster that these folks become, watch my existing YouTube videos where I have one on one debate or even a panel discussion about the dating of ancient events. Okay, let's go further. Oak's assumptions are baseless. What are those assumptions? <laughs> Mahabharat descriptions. Mahabharat descript descriptions from the Mahabharata text are the descriptions of a Mahabharata times. The calendar used in the Mahabharata text throughout the Mahabharata text is the calendar of a Mahabharata times. These are the assumption, guys. This is a common sense. Okay, and this fellow says they are baseless. What is the alternate assumption if this is not the assumption? Anyways, let's go further. And leaps of faith are large. I mean, this is like a very generic, casual, careless nonsense, okay? Person has to give examples. On the other hand, I'm going to give a very specific example. Okay, this is where underline. Then this forward writer says, actual direct and unambiguous statements about seasons and months in the dated text. Blah, 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 blah. Mm, yeah, and what is it, for example? Uh, okay, then he's going into another bile throw up there, but in between he says, actual direct and unambiguous statements about seasons and month in the dated text. So he means to say, I think they exist in the dated text. I do not understand what the hell is meant by dated text. This is from Mahabharata. Okay, so uh, Gita Press edition, critical edition number given and Gita Press edition number given 12.171.18, which means 12 parva, which is Shanti parva. 171 is the Adhyaya and 18 is a Shlok number in a Gita Press. Uh, but it's uh, very unambiguous, actual and direct in mention of a season and month is given. That's what he's trying to say. I do not understand what he means by dated text. Well, I have dated them to 7,500 years ago, 5561 BC as the year of Mahabharata war. Vasudev wrote it about 18 years after Mahabharata war, after 5561 BCE. You can add 18 to find out the approximate time when they were written. Uh, Vasudev Mahabharata tells us uh, took about three years to compose them. So that's the time period. I don't know if that's what he means by dated text in any case. Uh, and then he also gives um, the critical edition 
uh, version. So now understand, because of this, the numbering slightly changes. Instead of 171 Adhyay, it's 165 in critical edition. Instead of Shlok 18 versus it is 16, none of this matters. Okay, it must be noted down, by the way, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, or it may matter, then you have to explain why it matters. Okay, of the Mahabharat, which, Mahabharat, which clearly states that the full moon day of Kartika, that is uh, Kartik full moon, Kartik Purnima, coincided with the end of Sharad season. Okay. Autumn, people have to be very careful when you translate from Sanskrit to English. Sharad season, yes. But if you translate that as autumn, you can make a big blunder. Okay. Uh, because what is the word for Sharad? Hemanta many times is translated as autumn. Therefore, Sharad needs to be translated as a pre-autumn. Okay, and Varsha as a rainy season, Grishma as a summer season, spring as a, I mean, Vasanta as a spring season, Shishir as a winter season, and Hemanta uh, as an autumn season. Therefore, Sharad should be translated as a pre autumn, six season. You have to do the six to six correspondence. Okay, it's important. I'm just bringing it out because by taking autumn, again, many Mahabharata dating researchers, uh, not in this case, but have made a royal mess. Okay, and we will talk as we explore this field. Okay, are totally ignored by Oak. So the person is saying this reference is been ignored by me. Again, utter nonsense. Now, what part is a nonsense that is ignored by me in dating Mahabharata? That is utter nonsense. I have ignored that reference while dating Mahabharata, but for a reason, because this particular reference, although it exists in the Mahabharata text, has absolutely, decisively, precisely, unambiguously, directly, and actually have nothing, I repeat, have nothing to do with the time of the Mahabharata war. Therefore, just somebody knowing how to read English, how to read Sanskrit, how to know, interpret the words is not sufficient. The person needs a scientific acumen, Vidyana Buddhi. The person needs a good knowledge of Tarka Shastra, Tantra Yukti, common sense. If that is missing, this kind of humor, but this kind of sad humor, disaster, nonsense gets created. Let's look at that. So the specific reference that is given, is it actual direct and unambiguous statement? The answer is yes. And that is actually going to help us to show why this particular reference, although it appears in the Mahabharata text, has absolutely, positively, decisively, nothing, nada to do with the timing of Mahabharata. And therefore, this reference should not be included in dating the timing of Mahabharata. But that is apparently seems to be done by this individual. Okay. Uh, now, funny enough, this individual, to the best of my knowledge, has not bothered to tell us, according to him, what is the year of Mahabharat War or what is even the approximate time, say 500 years, plus minus 500 years, plus minus 200 years, plus minus 100 years, maybe even plus minus 1000 years. What is the timing of Mahabharat War? Okay, go figure. So this is called Vitanda. You know, we, what is it? So Prati Paksha Sthapana Hino Vitanda. Another person has put a specific claim for that year. You are not coming up with your own claim. So Prati Paksha Sthapana Hino Vitanda. You have not established, one does not establish one's own claim, but keeps on fighting in a stupid fashion with the other person. That's called Vitanda. That person needs a rebuke and should be removed from the discussion. Well, where are these Nyaya experts? Where are our Sanskrit experts? Many people can recite Sanskrit, but not the subject matter experts. It's like saying somebody can read a, somebody can read a English and therefore think like, oh, this person can understand quantum mechanics. Some person reads uh, English and therefore he understand everything of chemical engineering. No, there is no guarantee of it just because you know the language. That's the problem here. Okay, the next point, uh, that this particular reference gives a season and a lunar month. That's correct. Okay. And let's see. Okay. And what is that season and lunar month that this particular reference gives? It gives Kartik Purnima and it says that is at the end of the Sharad season. So let's go look at the references. Gita Press 12.171.18. And from critical edition, exactly same word. Sometimes you see Pathabed. I don't know if there are Pathabed. We will look at it. 
Um, but it doesn't change the meaning drastically in this case, 12.165.16. .16. That's right here. Just so that you understand the context. Um, uh, Mahabharat war began on a Kartika Mausya. It went on for 18 days. On the 10th day, that is Margashirsha Shukla Navami. Vyasadev fell down in the battle. That was the 10th day of the war. Since that day, he was on the bed of arrows, Sharshaya. This is a visualization by artists. You don't have to take it literally. Again, that's a different subject, not relevant, but I just mention it because some idiot will just digress just looking at that picture. Therefore, I just mention it. This is not drawn by me. This is from a Gita press, by the way. Okay. All right. So now what happens? On the 10th day, Bhishma uh, fell down in the battle. Uh, war continues for additional eight days. So total of by the time 18th night is over, Vas, uh, Bhishma is lying on the bed of arrows for 10, uh, sorry, nine nights. Then uh, the last night, Ashwatthama comes to Pandava camps and kills the sons of Draupadi and many other warriors. He, then he runs away. The next day, Bhim and Arjun follow him, Ashwatthama. There is that Brahmastra battle going on. A lot of things happen. I'm going to skip that. Then what happens? Then the Kuru woman come to the battlefield. Followed by Yudhishthir giving instructions to Indra Sen, Sanjay, and many others to take care of all the bodies of the warriors. Okay, the big piles, uh, you know, the fire uh, chita, you know, are uh, created and the bodies are given the final fire sauskar. After that, all the Pandavas, along with uh, Krishna, Satyaki, Sanjay, Krupacharya, whoever is left there, Dhritarashtra, Gandhari, Kunti, they all go to the bank of Ganga and Mahabharata tells us this uh, number 12 Parva, Shanti Parva tells us that they stayed on the bank of Ganga for one month, Masam Ekam Bahipura. For one month, they stayed outside on the bank of Ganga. So just as a crude way, that those 30 days plus the nine days, we have got 39 days, uh, Bhishma is on the bed of arrows. After the month is over, uh, the Pandavas, with along with everyone, come back to Hastinapur. Then Yudhishthir is coronated. Yudhishthir's Rajabhishek happens. Yudhishthir assigns different um, administrative posts to his brothers and other individuals such as Sanjay and Indra Sen and so on. Uh, he uh, honors, you know, the relatives of the people who have lost their loved one in the war. He makes some arrangements for their well-being. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, he he uh, he uh, he assigns different palaces to his brothers and the extended uh, individuals. While this is going on, Krishna reminds Yudhishthir that somebody is waiting for him. And where does this come from? When they are on the bank of Ganga for a month, and many times when Yudhishthir is in a very distraught state, like uh, this mentally distraught states that some people do because of, again, Raga, Dvesha, Moha. Okay? In case of Yudhishthir, it is Moha, but also Raga, the emotion. And many times when he asks the questions, Vyasadev is there and Krishna is there and many others, uh, Vyasadev occasionally says, you know, hold on, hang on to that question. I will hang on to that question. I want you to ask that question to Bhishmacharya, okay? Because he will give a better response and so on. Uh, so that is the context. Uh, Krishna tells uh, Yudhishthir, hey, somebody is waiting for us. And uh, of course, Yudhishthir knows, but it's like a reminder, you know? And then he says, oh, well, Bhishmacharya is waiting for us at Kurukshetra. In a hurry, they leave from Hastinapur, come to Kurukshetra. So again, keep that in mind. First nine days have gone by, then additional 30 days, so approximately, and then one day in between, so 40 days for simplicity. This day, when they come back to Kurukshetra to meet Bhishma, uh, Krishna tells Bhishma that he has additional 56 days uh, left to live because he's referring to the day of winter solstice or one day after winter solstice because that's when Bhishma is going to attain Bhishma Nirvana, okay, because he's waiting for uh, the day of um, winter solstice, okay. Uttarayan astronomy speak, not like the way, you know, cultural celebration we do on 14th of January, okay, the 21st of December in our times, the equivalent of that. Of course, in the calendar, it will be a different day. In 5561, when Mahabharata war happened, it was 
30 January 5560 was the day of winter solstice and Bhishma passed away, Bhishma Nirvan on the day after, that is 31st January 5560. But on the day when Krishna and all the party meets uh, Bhishma Acharya, they say, Krishna says, you have 56 additional days to live. So you take that 56 days, add to 40. Now what do you got? You got 96 days there. Okay. And that 56 days, Again, Mahabharata gives us detailed accounts for many instances within that 56 days to explain how those 56 days were spent. For example, about five to six days, uh, every morning Yudhishthir alone or with his brothers or with few other individuals, Krishna, Satyaki, etc., will come just like this first day when he came, come to, uh, come to Bhishma, spend a whole day with Bhishma, debating, discussing, not debating, asking many questions and listening from Bhishma. At the end of the day, he will go back to Astinapur. This went on for about five, six days. On the last day, meaning that fifth or sixth day, uh, as the discussion continued, Bhagwan Krishna recited Shiva Sasranam, followed by uh, Bhishmacharya reciting Vishnu Sasranam. At that point, uh, Vasudev is also there in attendance, and Vasudev felt now uh, Yudhishthira has become calm. So he tells Bhishma, now please ask Yudhishthira to go back to Astinapur and not return, just like the way he's coming every day for the last five or six days, not return this time until the day of winter solstice, until the sun turns northward. That's the language used. So accordingly, Bhishma gives order, whatever you want to say it, Adnya to Yudhishthira to go back and not return. Yudhishthira does Namaskar, the whole entourage does Namaskar. This time, Dhritarashtra, Gandhari are also present. They go back to Hastinapur. Mahabharata text tells us now they lived in Hastinapur for 50 nights. So five to six nights, therefore I say the description comes one day after each day. But my point is even if something information is missing because Krishna says 56 and we also have additional information that when they return after Vishnu Sasranam, they live in Hastinapur for 50 nights. The math is perfect. 50 plus 6 plus now the 40, 96 plus. Okay, plus one is that the day after the winter solstice. So that's like 97, 98, somewhere there. Okay, so they uh, come back on the day after the winter solstice, 31st January 5560 BC. That is the day of Bhishma Nirvana and the things happen. In fact, Bhishma recalls the past 58 days. The first from the time these folks came after Yudhishthira Raja Bhishek to Hastinapur. Okay, if you count from those days, those are 58 days. That's what that's why Bhishma is saying Ashtapancha, Shatam, Ratram, Shayana, Syadda, Megata. Okay. And this is also confused by practically every other Mahabharat dating researcher. There is a verse next to it. Ma Magoyam Samanu Prapto Masa Punyo Idishara Tribhaga Shesha Pakshoyam Shukla Bhavitu Marasi. That is that can be interpreted in many different ways. It has been interpreted in many different ways. But just the word, some people stick to Maga. Maga is simply not possible. Now, it is worth asking why Bhishma is saying Maga. That is fair. But Maga is simply not possible because you have to have minimum of 95 days between the day of winter solstice and the 10th day of the war, which is Marga Shirsha Shukla Nomi. It cannot be any other day before. It can be after like wrongly claimed by many Mahavarata researchers, but it cannot be before Margashisha Shukla Nomi. And therefore, if you do the math, it cannot be the month of Magha or Magh. Okay, but the, that's a different story. Now, back to this. During those six days, when there's a lot of discussion going on between Yudhishthir and Bhishma, uh, there is a Moksha Dharma, Raja Dharma, Apad Dharma, on and on. In one context, uh, Yudhishthir asks a certain question to Bhishma and Bhishma is answering many of these questions with the help of actual historical events. So we are looking at Mahabharata as a Itihasa history to us, but Bhishma is quoting from his Itihasa. Again, remember the definition. Again, this is whole discussion is about what? Between Yudhishthir and Bhishma, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, a education for a king. Okay, Dharmartha Kama Mokshanam Upadesham Samanvitam Purva Vruttam Katha Yuktam 
ಇತಿಹಾಸಂ ಪ್ರಚಕ್ಷತೆ ಪೂರ್ವ ವೃತ್ತ ಸೊ ಭೀಷ್ಮ ಇನ್ ನ್ಯಾರೇಟಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಮೆಟಫರ್ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಸಿಮಿಲಿ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಕಥಾ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ ಟೆಲ್ಲಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ವೇ ಆಫ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನಿಂಗ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ಸ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ವಿ ರೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಬಯೋಗ್ರಫೀಸ್ ಅಸುಮಿಂಗ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಟ್ರೂತ್ಫುಲ್ ವೇ ಅಂಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಫ್ಲಾವರಿ ವೇ ರೈಟ್ ಬಯೋಗ್ರಫೀಸ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಮರಾಠಿ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಪುಡ್ಚಾಲ ಠೇಜ್ ಮಾಕ್ಸಾ ಶಾಣ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಗೆಟಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟಂಬಲ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಟೈಮ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಲರ್ನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅದರ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಸ್ಟಂಬಲಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಕಾಂಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ಭಿಷ್ಮಾ ಇಸ್ ಕೋಟಿಂಗ್ ಮೆನಿ ಮೆನಿ ಕಥಾ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ಯಾಟ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಆನ್ಶಿಯನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ನ್ಯಾರೇಟಿವ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸರ್ಪ್ರೈಸಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಕಾಂಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ಭಿಷ್ಮಾ ಇಸ್ ಕೋಟಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ವಿ ಗೋ ಟು ದಟ್ ಕಾಂಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ನೋನ್ ಆಸ್ ಕೃತಘ್ನ ಗೌತಮ ಉಪಾಖ್ಯಾನ್ okay so what my experience of last 15 years in i mean of course there are many great people who admire my research uh, and uh, doing a lot of great work but uh, there are folks who are essentially krutagna instead of feeling instead of feeling thankful for the painstaking work i have done they show their appreciation <laughs> for it appreciation in a sarcastic sense i'm saying by being krutagna okay utterly idiotic utterly time wasters okay that's what we are experiencing here so there is this uh, the akhyan that uh, upakhyan you can say here the side story that vishma is telling is known as a krutagna gautam gautam upakhyan gautam upakhyanam but it's a gautam upakhyan okay uh, in that context something is happening we don't need to go through the whole story i would encourage people to go to uh, geeta press shanti parva okay <laughs> they don't need to ignore anything there and read that but the specific verse that this forward writer quoted is this visheshatastu kartikyam dvijebhya samprayachati charadvapaye ratnani pavana masya miti shruti okay and if you look at below just see it's not important but just see in case there is any uh, part of it pavana masya miti shruti visheshatastu kartikya dvijebhya samprayachati actually no no part of it in this case not that that would have mattered quickly let's look at the uh, gita press translation visheshata kartiki purnima ko jab ki kartiki purnima means the full moon would be near nakshatra krutika now you have again if i'm going to say something you say oh how come that's possible then that means you don't understand in the indian lunisolar calendar the full moon of a kartik purnima actually in reality will be at krutika plus minus two nakshatras sometime it can be even three nakshatras but let's take two nakshatras for now when can it happen three nakshatras when a adhik masa comes into picture but let's not make it complicated so the full moon or the purnima moon, moon is full moon is near krutika plus minus two nakshatras that's what the kartik that would qualify or even three nakshatras would qualify as a kartik purnima i have shown it with the actual empirical data so kartik purnima it is and what does it say jabki sharad rutu ki samapti hoti hai okay samprachati kartikya dvijeb samprachati okay and purnamasya miti shruti so and then he's saying aisa maine sunne aisa sunne mein aaya hai because he is he is narrating a story of the past just like when we are talking about mahabharat we said hey, i heard that um, jayadrath did this so and so is this true in that sense but here is saying i said i have heard i meaning bishma has heard wo brahmanon ko ratnon ka daan karta tha aisa sunne mein aaya hai so when kartik purnima and kartik purnima coincided with the end of sharad rutu uh, okay so remember if you translate as a autumn in fact it will be very interesting if it's truly taken taken as a autumn <laughs> now on the second thought i'm saying uh, we should literally take uh, this forward writer's word word for word because you know he's he he boasts about being very precise so when he translates sharad as a autumn that is actually wrong translation it should have been pre autumn translation if you take sharad as a truly autumn as in hemanta then it will create a bigger disaster okay if i have a time i will mention that then this particular instance i would say it has not happened in our times right now if you take truly sharad as a autumn and literally autumn as in the hemanta rutu therefore i'm saying pre autumn is the correct translation but uh, when uh, these folks are corrected with their wrong translations they get emotional ragadvesha moh arthantar bhavat and just go on go on a bizarre tangents okay so this sharad should be pre autumn but if it's autumn as in like a hemanta 
what because autumn should be a correct translation of Hemanta and not of a Sharad. Sharad should be translated as a pre-autumn. I'm repeating this because these guys go into nitty-gritty details on such stupid matters, which has no relevance for the dating study of Mahabharata, even though the stuff is in the Mahabharata. Okay. All right. So the reason I'm saying is if autumn is taken as a Hemanta Rutu, then Kartik Purnima matching with the end of autumn has not happened in our times. In fact, it will happen about 1000 to 2000 years in the future. But remember the phenomenon of the precession of the earth's axis. So if it is truly taken as Kartik Purnima matching with autumn, as in the way translated as Hemanta and not Sharad, then we, since this is not happening in our times, it won't happen for another thousand plus years. We have to go back about 25,000 years in antiquity. That's when this would happen. Okay. But let's give uh, this forward writer a benefit of doubt. Okay. The kind of courtesy he will not extend to others. Okay. But let's extend this in our infinite kindness. <laughs> And let's translate that Sharad as a pre-autumn. Okay, which means what? Uh, two months, the pre-autumn, that Sharad season, it ends two months before the day of winter solstice. Okay, now first, we, before we go into astronomy, first the context of this. So to understand the context, in what context this is being discussed, just because it's in the Mahabharata, and some person carelessly and casually just jumps and saying, oh, okay, so this is when Mahabharata happened. But if you ask that person, so tell me when exactly this time refers to, then the person will just keep the mouth shut. And thank God, like Mark Twain said, you know, if we already have a doubt about your stupidity, don't open the mouth and completely remove all the doubt, you know, don't do that. So in that sense, somewhat intelligent thing that they don't open the mouth and don't dare say, based on this, when did Mahabharata war happen? Today, I'm going to tell you when that Mahabharata war if somebody foolishly, idiotically, and in a wrong fashion takes this reference as referring to the timing of Mahabharata war, it leads to extremely disastrous, stupid, idiotic, illogical conclusions. That's what I'm going to show. But something before that. Now, why this stuff comes in Mahabharata? It is in Mahabharata and still should not be taken in defining the timing of Mahabharata. In order to figure this out, you cannot just look at this verse and just jump into some uh, argumentation and that to a stupid argumentation. Go back 12.171.18. Krutagna Gautamo Pakyan. What is the context of this? Therefore, I'm taking you back. If you are looking at the Gita Press edition, oh yeah, then you have to go back to Adhyay 168, from 171 back to 168, about three Adhyay before. If you are looking at the critical edition, there it was what, 1. Uh, 165? That L is an error there, okay, 165. Mm, sorry. So here we are going back to 162. So 163, 164, 165. See, there is before in both cases. This is not even the beginning, by the way, I'm quoting verse 28, but this is that Krutagna Gautamo Pakhyan, how appropriate the title, okay? Just by coincidence, Krutagna, yeah. That's what these folks are, uh, okay? They will not comprehend, never mind appreciating, they will not comprehend even a precise, accurate, impeccable research, but even find, try to find faults with their own lack of intelligence, lack of understanding the context, and just... Wasting this time. Now, this, if we take this as educational, oh, yeah, definitely this is very useful. So let's do that. Okay, so three chapters before, and this is not even the beginning of that Krutagna Gautama Pakhyan, but uh, the relevant verses I wanted to bring that uh, um, every, I encourage everyone to go and read this. Yudhishthira is asking a certain question. For example, I'll just quickly read the translation to uh, limit the time here. Uh, Yudhishthira ne kaha, Pitama. Apne jis mitra drohi or krutagna kaha, ap, sorry, apne jise mitra drohi or krutagna kaha hai, uska yatartha ityas kya hai, yamai vistar purvak sunna chata hu, ap krupa karke muje batai hai. 
देन भीष्म हुआ जो भीष्म कहते हैं भीष्म जी ने कहा नरेश्वर मीन्स युधिष्ठिर मैं प्रसन्नता पूर्व प्रसन्नता पूर्वक तुम्हें एक पुराना इतिहास बता रहा हूं यह घटना उत्तर दिशा में म्लेंचो के देश में घटित हुई थी दिस इज नॉट इवन इवेंट और इंसिडेंट दैट हैपन इन कुरुक्षेत्र इट हैपन इन द फर्दर नॉर्थ नॉर्थ वेस्ट एंड दैट एरिया इन द म्लेंच देश एंड दिस इज बिफोर द महाभारत टाइम बिफोर सेवन मोर देन सेवन थाउजेंड फाइव हंड्रेड इो वी डोंट नो हाउ फार बैक वी हैव टू गो That is not given here, and then he goes on. Madhya Pradesh ka ek Brahman jisne Ved bilkul nahi pada tha, koi sampan nagav dekkar usme big mangne ke liye gaya wagre. But main point is Bishma is telling an instance that is historical with respect to the timing of Mahabharata itself. It has nothing nada to do with the timing of Mahabharata. We are going to find lot of interesting things. By the way, the right side the verses are from critical edition. In this case, they are exactly the same. There may be some slight uh, part of it. For example, gramam rudhi yutam uh, rudhi yutam here gramam preksham jana kirno, or there may be they don't change overall meaning. We are good on that front. Okay, now let's look at uh, the the massive uh, stupidity at work. Okay, all right. Let's go slowly. Kartik Purnima. at the end of sharad season i repeat it must be translated as pre autumn and not autumn if it's a autumn literally autumn as in hemanta rutu then such a situation is not happening not going to happen for next 1000 plus years 2000 years and if we have to go back look for this situation we have to go back in the past at least 25000 years this is something that can be easily verified by someone with a basic but correct knowledge of astronomy now that is also a big problem here but let's not make it uh, more complicated okay second uh, second half of sharad season can be considered a broader period of end of sharad season i'm giving this uh, forward writer a benefit of doubt okay i'm saying exactly how do you define end of sharad season sharad every season six season every season has got two months okay how do we define sharad season sharad season uh, is uh, so the uh, fall equinox or the autumnal equinox uh, or uh, we will call sharad sampat is the midpoint of a sharad season so sharad sampat one month before and one month after is the sharad season sharad sampat is what we call fall equinox or autumnal equinox okay now i hope this person doesn't come and says look it's called autumnal equinox that is a word coverage it's really a sharad sampat okay and autumn uh, if you have to look at the six season names then somebody has to explain what is sharad called in english if you consider it autumn then one has to explain what is hemanta rutu called in english and so on okay so translating that's many other mahabharata researchers have made a royal disaster out of these translations okay but let's stick to this fellow number 3 time interval when kartik purnima coinciding with last few days of sharad season can be considered as the validation of the above reference okay because what is the reference again uh, that kartik purnima jabki sharad rutu ki samapti hoti hai okay so what i am doing is giving a full benefit of doubt the doubt to this forward writer and i'm saying um, so as long as the uh, kartik purnima coincides with the last part of sharad season okay second half last say last 15 days of the sharad season that should be considered reasonable and it is reasonable do you know why because uh, the uh, seasons happens because due to the solar sun's position of the sun now sun's position doesn't change a lot from year to year but the position of the moon does especially in the context of a lunar month such as the kartik full moon okay that's why we have to add the adhika masa to bring the lunar calendar in synchronicity with the solar calendar therefore it will go back and forth and it will vary over a plus minus 15 days from the median position again read my bhishma nirvana book if you want to understand the concept of central tithi and the variation that happens around it how it is affected by adhika masa and how eventually it is affected by the precession of the earth's axis with the lunar month completely shifting 
with respect to the season. It happens very slowly, but there is a complete shift of a lunar month with respect to season. That is the definition. That's like a first principle. That's the basic definition of what the precession of the Earth's axis is. Again, this forward writer, but also the book for which the author, for whom he's writing this forward for the book, both do not understand this phenomenon of the precession of the Earth's axis, precession of the equinoxes, and why the lunar month, the Indian lunar month, how it shifts, okay, with respect to the season. Anyways, that's the definition of a precession of Earth's axis, sidereal versus tropical calendar. Sidereal is a star. When the star changes, nakshatra changes, guess what? The season of the lunar month will change. Guys, this is astronomy 101. 101. But if you get that wrong, guess what? The disaster after disasters, one disaster after disaster. Imagine this as a metaphor. The guy just driving on the road, but not stopping at every red signal. One time he may be lucky. Next time he may be lucky. Third time he may be lucky. Well, the luck is going to soon run out. This is a good example of luck running out. Uh, okay. But still giving a benefit of doubt because that's the nature of a <laughs> Indian lunisolar calendar, the lunar months with respect to the cardinal points such as fall equinox, autumnal equinox, Sharad Sampath. So what we'll do is, uh, we will take 30 days uh, before and after the day of autumnal equinox, fall equinox as our Sharad season. That is the definition of a Sharad season. And since lunar tithi for a specific lunar month, which I just explained, varies with respect to solar cardinal point, it's not same. Okay. For example, 21st of December is winter solstice in our times. It may change to 22nd uh, December. 21st, 22nd actually doesn't change beyond that for easily like I would say 1000 years, 500 years, but let's say maybe go to 20, maybe 23rd. I'm just giving you as a extremely wide scenario. It won't change more than that. That is not true for the day of Kartik Purnima. The Kartik Purnima, in fact, is going to change over a period of 30 days with respect to the fixed position of the sun with respect to cardinal points. This is actually, guys, very basic, okay, 101. But the reason I'm taking time is because this forward writer or for the person whom is writing the forward, they have made a disaster out of this, okay? That's why I'm taking time. So since lunar tithi for a specific lunar month varies with respect to the solar cardinal points, such as fall equinox, Vasanta Sampath, Sharada Sampath, winter solstice, summer solstice, Dakshinayana Bindu, Uttarayana Bindu, etc., we will take the midpoint of the second half of Sharad season as our target to match the Kartika full Purnima day. And by the way, this can be changed to the last day instead of a midpoint, be my guest. Uh, you can take the day as autumnal equinox, but that will be wrong because that will not be considered the end of Sharad season. Why would you consider the mid of the Sharad season as the end of Sharad season? So therefore, I'm giving the benefit of doubt to this junta and saying, the second month of the Shara season, let's take a midpoint of that, okay? But if somebody wants to go further to the end of it, be my guest. And the midpoint, as in to say, therefore, we show Kartik Purnima anywhere between these plus minus 15 days. Uh, that can be uh, as a giving a benefit of doubt to this junta, be taken as the uh, Kartik Purnima coinciding with the end of Shara season. Fair? Okay, let's look at what's happening in our times. For example, uh, next year, 16 November 2024 would be a Kartik full moon day. And this would be during the first half of Hemanta season, just at the beginning of Hemanta season. Okay, I'm giving you the simulation here. Now, I don't want to open another can of worms. When these guys are exposed, their foolishness, nonsense, idiocy is exposed. Now, what do they do? they go and start talking about the how the software is not reliable, <laughs> okay? And how the hell they know that the software is not reliable? <laughs> By looking at another software, okay? There is enough of humor in Mahabharata, Mahabharata dating research, Ramayana dating research, antiquity research. If you think this is not fun, guys, okay? Stay tuned. All right. So next year, 16 November 2024 would be Kartik Purnima. And... 
from this is a lunar calendar, right? Because full moon is near Kritika. You can see that here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, this is Kritika stars here. This is full moon. Okay. And you can do your own simulations. And that's November 16, 2024. That's next year. And now again, you have to actually go. I have done it for your benefit, but you can do it. Um, now, on this day, you have to go and note down the position of the sun. And then you have to go forward or backward, in this case, backward, to notice how many days between that particular day and the day of uh, Sharad Sampath. Okay. And that's where, based on that, I'm saying that this occurred. So what will happen next year will be uh, during the first half of Hemanta season. So this can be seen as the beginning of a Hemanta, which some people may interpret that as an end of Sharad. I'm not asking you to do one way or the other. So just giving you a reference point in our times. Let's go further. So this itself tells me that if I want to coincide, match the Kartik full moon with the, uh, uh, what is that? Yeah, with the end of Sharad, I have to at least go back by 2000 years. How do I know that? That's when the basic astronomy 101, the precession of the Earth's axis, the lunar month, the Indian lunar month, especially because it is its name comes from the vicinity of a full moon with respect to a specific nakshatra. That's how the names are Chaitra, Vaishak, Drishta, Ashar, Shravan, Bhadrapad, okay, and so on. Kartik, Margashrisha, Paush, Mark, Falgun. Based on that, the lunar month will shift with respect to a given season, any season. We are not talking any specific month. You know, that's a cycle by one month every 2000 years. So I'm saying, okay, hey, we are at the first half of Hemanta. I need to go back one month to the second half of Sharad. That is the end of Sharad. So I need to go back by approximately 2000 years. Let's do that. Okay. Um, okay. So what I have here, okay, so I went back 2000 years and then I tried to find a particular day when the full moon is near Kritika. This is Kritika here, this is full moon and that particular time, whatever that time came. Uh, yeah, so Kartik Purnima occurred on October 30, uh, 31st October, 1 BCE and this day, now remember, 37 days after the day of autumnal equinox, Sharad Sampath. So remember, Sharad Rutu, we have to take plus minus 30 days. So Sharad Sampath is there. That happened. Then 30 days are gone by. Additional seven days. And that's when Kartik full moon coincided um, at that point. Seven days after, which is what? The beginning of a Hemanta season. Seven days into Hemanta season. Can we take that as the end of uh, Sharad Rutu? If you do, then what this is saying is now remember what this uh, forward uh, forward writing is claiming. This instance that Mahabharata tells us happened long before. We don't know how long before, but definitely before Mahabharata because Bhishma is describing this instance as happening itihasa, purva itihasa. Okay? So definitely before Mahabharata is happening 2000 years ago in our calendar, guys. 2000 years. Now, somebody who doesn't understand astronomy says, but hold on, the seven days into Hemanta season. Now, can we just go back and see if I can salvage my case and save my ass? Okay, well, let's try to give them a benefit of doubt and do it. Okay, so how far we can go back? We cannot go back too far back. Do you know what will happen? Then the Kartik Purnima will not occur in the second half or in the last 15 days of the Sharad season. Okay, we need that in order to match this description that is given, Kartik Purnima coinciding with the end of Sharad season. So uh, I said, let's make a small correction of 500 years. Let's go back by 500 years and then try to find a situation when again, a full moon will be near Kritika. That is a Kartika full moon, Kartik Purnima and find out what that time is. Okay, so I went back by additional 500 years, so to 500 BCE, Kartik Purnima occurred there. One instance, you'll find many such instances if you go through it. Uh, 28 October, 500 BCE. Again, you can see full moon near Kritika. And uh, this day was about 30 days, to be precise, 28 days. So like two days remaining at the end of uh, Sharad season, uh, you know, 30 days from the Vasanta Sampa. Okay, the last number 10 is a perfect example 
of matching the description given by Bhishmacharya to Yudhishthir. Which description? This description. Kartik full moon, Japki Sharad Rutuki Samapti Hutia. So Kartik Purnima coinciding with the end of Sharad Rutu. That happened in our times in 500 BCE. It was also happening uh, around 1 BCE. Not that bad. Okay. Now, if you go to 1000 BCE, would you able to claim that it is kind of happening? Yeah. If you give a benefit of doubt and say, hey, you know what? Even 15 days before the Sharad Rutu ends or 20 days before Sharad Rutu ends, it can be still considered end of Sharad Rutu. In a practical language, we say that all the time. We might look at December, I mean, on our calendar and we say, oh, the year is already over. My God, the new year is here. This is the language we speak. That doesn't mean actually the new year has began, but we may say that even in December. Okay. Something in that language, if you want to give a benefit of doubt to again this junta, you may, may be able to go back by additional 500 years. I have not done that. People can do it. 2000 BC. But then what is based on this erroneous, wrong, idiotic, stupid interpretation? What is the outcome? The outcome is that this forward writer is saying that Mahabharat war happened sometime after 1000 BC. Well, that's like giving too much benefit of doubt, but that itself is wrong. It, it is worth asking how many people would agree with that. But very realistic is that person basically saying based on uh, bullet number 7, 8, 9, 10, that this person is saying Mahabharat war happened this person, meaning the forward writer, okay, is saying Mahabharat war happened long time after 500 BC, long time after 1 BC, long time after Jesus. Guys, if you do not have a Vaptidnyan, if you do not know how to use a Viveka Buddhi when you look at the evidence, if you do not use this, this case, that is not a problem. But in other cases, you may find some evidence. And just because in Mahabharat, even at the time of Mahabharat war, therefore you try to match it, it may lead you to wrong conclusions. Once you once it reach, takes you to the wrong conclusion or takes you to some conclusion, you have to look at additional evidence and say, hey, is my all evidence leading me to that point or it is just one random stray evidence? Because we have a part of it, we have interpolations, we have to be aware of that. Fortunately, this is not even a problem here. As the forward writer said, that this evidence is indeed actual, direct, and unambiguous. A clear season and a clear lunar month is given. What is the problem? Yes, it is actual. Yes, it is direct. Yes, it is unambiguous. And it is saying that this particular event is referring to something happening long time before the Mahabharata war, not at the time of Mahabharat war and not after the Mahabharat war. But if this error of this forward writer is not understood and not corrected, now he will not correct. It will be interesting to see if he corrects and apologizes. Okay. <laughs> it will be very interesting to see. Okay. If he has guts and courage to apologize. Okay. Uh, but he's not going to do it. But we are learning from his blunder, okay? So, for example, the, his, if, he ex, if he sticks to what he is saying, and he will, okay? Very likely he will. Then the conclusion that is drawn from it, he's not going to draw because he will know what a blunderous, what a uh, erroneous conclusion that is. So, he will try to change the goalpost and, you know, the standard things that he does. You can watch those. But, Objectively speaking, with a cool headed, removed of emotion, okay, by removing the dvesh, okay, by removing the emotion and by removing the stupidity, which means with the help of knowledge of astronomy, of the translation, of the context in which this katha is being narrated by Bhishma to Yudhishthir, what can we conclude? If we conclude in his way, that basically says Mahabharata war happened in the last 2,500 years, which means what? Sometime contemporary to Greeks, even not contemporary to Greeks, after Greeks, after Jesus, okay? 
And, you know, he's in a good company of Sheridan Pollock, who thinks Mahabharat just didn't happen. It was written in 150. He's in a good company of Michael Witzel. He's in a good company of Hopkins of Harvard, who just sat down in the chair and said, oh, I think it's 400 CE. So he has a company. Okay. I mean, his choice. But based on a common sense, based on the science, based on enormous 300 plus astronomy evidence itself, and then, of course, the geology evidence, hydrology evidence, seismology evidence, climatology evidence, physical anthropology evidence, genetics evidence, geology evidence, morphodynamics of rivers evidence, climatology, we know it is 5561 BC. No ifs, no buts. But, so if this is wrong, then what is the correct answer? The 500 BC is what this forward um, writer is leading to that conclusion. He will not accept, he even doesn't know how to calculate this. Even he will not trust this calculation. See, that's the kind of, you know, this is like Adnyasya Ashraddha Dhanasya Saushay Atma Vinashyati Nase Dnyana Nase Shraddha Saushay Nasala Puram Vinashyati Adnyasya Ashraddha Dhanasya Saushay Atma Vinashyati The person doesn't have a knowledge, required knowledge. The person doesn't have the required Shraddha Adnyasya Ashraddha Dhanasya and full of doubt. Again, why doubt? Tatrairasham, raga, dvesha, moha, arthantra, bhavat. Raga, emotion, dvesha, okay, full anxiety, total hate for some individuals such as myself, and moha, lack of intellect, stupidity. That's three coming together, all of them, into this. So if it's not 500 BC, then what is? Just purely based on the data that is presented to us, okay, now, Mahabharata data tells us it happened 5561 BC. That's more than 7,500 years ago. So actually what happens is, as I said, to in order for us to have this similar situation occur again, which is a Kartik month matching with the end of Sharad season, which was happening around, say, 500 BCE. But that, once we understand, people have to understand that this is wrong. This is a disaster. This is a royal disaster. To say that based on that statement, which has nothing to do with the Mahabharata, in fact, it is historical to Mahabharata. But if someone takes it in that blindness, in that moha, in that mood, okay, taking that, hey, Mahabharat, guess what? If Mahabharata says so, what can I do? Mahabharata war must have happened after 500 BC or after Jesus. Hey, be my guest. Okay, I don't want to play a part in that stupidity. But then we still have to answer, so what is the significance of Vyasadeva saying that? For that, remember what I said before? If it is not happening, I mean, if it's if 500 BC or 2000 years ago is not the correct answer, the time of Greeks is not the correct answer, the time of Nicaea Council is not the correct answer, for Mahabharata to happen or this event to happen, which is before Mahabharata, according to this forward writer, then what choice we have? Actually, the choice we have is, again, remember the precision of the Earth's axis, the precision of the equinoxes. We can go back in time. How far back we have to go? I'm just giving you approximate number. We a 26,000 year cycle. We will need to go approximately uh, about... 20,000 years, about 20 to 22,000 years in antiquity from today. So if the if we trust the description of Bhishma telling Yudhishthir that this particular Krutadhana Gautam story uh, happening where Kartika full moon was coinciding with the end of Sharad season and that happened before the Mahabharata war. And guys, 5561 is the answer. But even if you take some other totally buffoon, you know, buffoonery claims, I don't know how many, 50, 60 plus in the range of 3000 BC plus minus 100 years. Even from there, still the answer is because that time it will not match because only answer is 500 BCE and after. So no matter what date of Mahabharata, dating one considers, as long as that date is, say, before 1000 BC, the person still has to accept that this particular story and the particular very accurate, precise, unambiguous description of Kartik Purnima matching with the end of Sharad season is taking us to 
20,000 to 22,000 years in the past, which is what? About 18,000 to 20,000 BCE. That's the time of this Krutagna Gautam story. That's the story of this. So Girish uh, Naikji and of course others, uh, please let me know if this was useful, if you understood the explanation and if still there are any doubts, definitely bring it to my attention and I'll be happy when time permits, I'll be happy to do a session like this. Okay. Um, my, I'm recording it uh, right uh, on the 29th March night. Okay. This is a wonderful celebration time. Uh, the Rama Naomi, Bhagwan Ram's birth. He was born in the Grigo in the Julian calendar, extended into antiquity on 29th November, 12,240 BCE, more than 14,000 years ago. If you want to know the exact year, all you have to do is take 12,240, add 2,023. You know those many years ago, Bhagwan Ram was born. It's a time for celebration. It's time for contemplation. Okay. It's time for all of us to pray for a good intellect. Okay. Removal of our doubts, a control of our emotions, like bring a samyak attitude. Okay. And to remove the dvesha from our hearts. Hopefully, this serves as a good lesson. Okay. That why we need a effort and effort okay actually effort to come up with answer the answer may be wrong for example when i had a debate with others i have a great respect for them and i will mention um, uh, dr konradest or uh, dr manish pandit okay now hey we don't agree on the claims but it takes a lot of courage to actually come up with a date or in case of manish pandit it's even a tough job you know he is borrowing dates of uh, Mm, uh, uh, pro, uh, what is that, Professor Srinivas Raghavan, then modifying it, you know, try to uh, patch up the problems that exist, intrinsic problems into 3067 claim, which were made worse by uh, Professor Narari Achar. And it's a lot of patchwork, you know, I mean, a, a very old car is given to you with lots of defects and you're trying to fix it. That's what Manish Pandit is doing, but he's emotionally attached. Again, that's a problem, okay, that raga. Okay, he may not have a dvesha, he may have a love for that, uh, you know, the old, whatever the previous guys have done. Uh, and the muda is a problem. Incompetence in astronomy is a problem, but it's not about Dr. Manish Pandit today. So let's not talk about that. There is enough to talk about his, uh, whatever fun things he has done. But back to this, uh, greetings to everyone on the day of Ramanomi. Uh, let's celebrate. Let's, uh, this month is good, by the way. Okay, so again, I don't feel any dvesha for this forward uh, writer or uh, the individual who writes the book and has written a book uh, pretentiously criticizing or claiming my work, which, which I love. I, I today posted the cover page of this book. Okay, uh, definitely read my books, read these books and uh, improve your own intelligence, the readers and come to your own conclusions. At the end of it, you think that one is a perfect, I mean, whatever the date they are proposing, I don't think they are proposing, that's a problem. That's a vitanda. So pratipaksha sthapana hino vitanda. Or just fighting for the heck of it is a jalpa, okay? And naturally, when you get into jalpa vitanda, do you know what happens? Okay, this is like, you know, once it starts with a desire, desire leads to kama, kama leads to krodha, okay? And then, you know, sammoha, you know, your delusion starts. And Smriti Bhamsha, Smriti Bhamsha, then Buddhi Nasha. It's just a downhill journey. That happens with even these other uh, other issues also. Anyways, greetings to all of you for the day of Ramanomi. Uh, let's try to build a Samyak knowledge. Bhagavad Gita is a great text to build that Samyak knowledge. If in one word I have to say what Bhagavad Gita is, I would say Samyak. Samyak Buddhi, a balanced knowledge, you know. Samaloshtashma Kanchana. Okay, then what do we say? Uh, basically, we are, uh, you know, tulya ninda stuti stuti mauni. You know, like we just uh, take both things as long as they are useful. I mean, it's a great thing. We can consider this as a mantan. If this leads to introspection of our own errors, I will. I have made many errors, guys, in this research. You know, when I was doing this, and there were great folks who were brutal on me 
Okay, I mean, uh, some of that correspondence is still there. And when the time permits, uh, I will bring that out. Like sometime I have thought something is happening this way and the other person is trying to tell me, it took me a while sometime, like a couple of months, sometime weeks before I understood my mistake. So yes, I mean, uh, I want to, uh, there is no uh, any ill will towards these folks, you know, in a way, willingly or unwillingly, knowingly or unknowingly, they are contributing to this mantan. And uh, Sir Karl Popper will say, the strength of a theory, the strength of a claim is only known, only known when it faces resistance. When people critique it, people criticize it, and the strength of theory, strength of a claim is only known in its multiple efforts repeatedly in how it withstands against such attacks. Okay. And so every time I'm in my initial complaint, when I published my, when did the Mahabharata war happen in 2011, was like, you know, nobody was saying anything. I mean, people were praising me, but the praise has a value, but it's a limited value. But nobody was coming and saying me. Then finally, slowly, people started trickling in and a lot of good, useful feedback. And now it has become even vicious. And I consider that very good. Okay. Because vicious feedback, uh, which usually comes from that Ragadvesha Moha place. Okay. And therefore, <laughs> you know, I don't have to do anything. I mean, I spent now, what, one hour, 20 minutes explaining this just on a very small thing, not even related to the dating of Mahabharata, but someone thought it relates to the dating of Mahabharata. Okay, a lot of fun. Uh, please pay attention to this. Watch multiple times if you need to. Uh, uh, borrow or purchase a astronomy software. I use Voyager 4.5 here. You can purchase anything else. Be aware of the variations, the defects and so on. You need to sometimes calibrate and do it. Voyager 4.5 is phenomenal, but you don't have to take my word for it. Whatever works for you. Repeat this. I have given you specific situation right down to the minute and timing. November 16, 2024. October 31, 1 BC. October 28, 500 BC. See if you can exactly match. If not, why not? But the conclusion remains that what this forward writer is claiming is a disaster. That would simply mean that Mahabharata war happened sometime after Greeks, sometime uh, after Jesus, assuming Jesus existed. That's another subject. Uh, definitely around the Council of Nicaea. Okay. And, uh, you know, again, as much as uh, idiotic and ridiculous that is, he's in a good company, like great Columbia professor Sheldon Pollock or uh, late professor Hopkins of Harvard. So maybe that's what these guys are aiming for. And that's why they are claiming such things. Okay, again, uh, greetings to all of you for uh, the wonderful uh, auspicious day of Rama Naomi. Um, have a great celebration. Uh, make a commitment to yourself to maybe read some portion of Valmiki Ramayana. Take to the study of Bhagavad Gita. I'm simply guys sharing whatever worked for me. Okay, um, and uh, all the best. Do let me know in your comments, uh, everyone, but especially Girish Naikji, do let me know. Uh, what you think of it? Still, there is a confusion. Was this clarifying? Is this useful? And frankly, you know what? We can do this for every nitty gritty, chaotic thing that is being created by other, many other, not all, Mahabharata dating researcher, Ramayana dating researcher, Sushruta dating researchers, um, Bhagavata dating researchers. We can go on and on. Okay. Namaskar.